Welcome to Restaurant Influencers presented by Entrepreneur Media. My name is Sean Walcha, founder of Cali Barbecue and Cali Barbecue Media. I want to give a special shout out to Toast, our primary title sponsor for believing in this show, believing in the power of media and storytelling in restaurants. Um, we're very excited today because in life, in the restaurant business and in the new creator economy, we learn through lessons and stories. Today, we have one of the world's leading roasters of specialty coffee and tea, the CEO, Sanjiv Razdan of the Coffee, Bean and Tea Leaf. Welcome, Sanjiv. Uh, Sean, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here and uh, very grateful. Well, we, uh, we, it, it's amazing to me for anybody that's listening to this show. First of all, if you're new, welcome, but um, dream big dreams. I never thought that as a single unit barbecue restaurant owner opening in 2008, that we would have a show with Entrepreneur Magazine on a global scale, reaching millions of people, being able to interview the top, the best of the best. We always say people that are playing the game within the game. And um, as I've looked into your background and where you've come from and where you're going, I'm really excited for today's conversation. I'm going to start with our favorite favorite random question, which is where in the world is your favorite stadium, stage, or venue? Ooh. <laughs> uh, it's right here in LA. I absolutely love the Hollywood Bowl. Uh, ever since I set my uh, eyes on it, I'm really, really fond of um, live music. And just the vibe of Hollywood Bowl is just so special. It's got so much history and legacy. Uh, sense of community, particularly after COVID, to be together with so many people and just this iconic environment. I absolutely love it. Okay, so we're going to go to the Hollywood Bowl. I'm going to convince Entrepreneur. I'm going to convince Toast, um, Atmosphere, Davo. These are the sponsors of our show. I'm going to convince them that we need to do a hospitality leadership conference. And I'm talking about the best of the best. I know you believe in mentorship. I know you believe in continually learning. But the people that are listening to this show, no matter where you are on earth, we're going to put you at the Hollywood Bowl. We're going to put you on center stage. And I want you to give us the two-minute elevator pitch for the coffee bean and tea leaf. So the coffee bean and tea leaf is uh, a absolutely authentic brand that brings flavors of wonderful teas and coffees from around the world that we bring through our cafes and our e-commerce and grocery business to our consumers around the world. Uh, we've been around since 1963. We've been doing this a while. We have relationships directly with growers that we've nurtured, we're now buying from second and third generation growers. We roast our coffee with much love, care and attention. And hopefully our consumers feel the love and warmth when they come to us in our cafes. So that's Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf. I love it. So how many locations does Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf have currently? Worldwide, we're just short of 1,100. And wow. in the US, we're just over 200 locations. In the US, 200. How many different countries? We're in 28 countries, give or take. 28 um, countries. And do you have, what are the plans for 2023? How many, are, are we adding locations? Yeah, absolutely. Growth is very much on the cards around the world. Um, we're a publicly listed company, so I'm not at liberty to share exact numbers, but we're looking to grow internationally outside of the US, uh, both within the countries that we already operate in, but also exploring uh, opening some new countries. But more importantly, here, uh, my oversight is over uh, the Americas, and really bulk of that business is in the U.S., where we've got plans to grow here, both through our company-owned operations as well as uh, franchise locations. And we're also doing licensed, non-traditional locations at airports and college campuses and you know hospitals and, and the like. So very excited for our uh, growth plans here. I would love for you to talk more. It's one of the uh, underlying theses of this show is to have restaurant owners think differently and to think of themselves of e as e-commerce companies, as content companies, um, but especially for non-traditional. Can we can we start with uh, why why non-traditional locations and give me more um, behind the scenes to the to the strategy? So I will um, share with you, Sean, why non-traditional for coffee bean and tea leaf, but with the lens of you know, entrepreneurs were thinking about their own business, how to think about this uh, opportunity as well. I think what does extremely well in non-traditional locations are concepts or formats that are 
um, relevant to captive audiences that have a very, very quick um, turnaround time, be it prep time or cook time or assembly time, whatever you're thinking, and that they have broad consumer appeal, right? This has to appeal to a lot. It's, this is not a place for niche products. So when you think about the coffee bean and tea leaf, people want to have their favorite beverage if they're at an airport or a hospital or you know a college campus. We can turn these around pretty quickly and they have broad consumer appeal, which is why uh, these locations do incredibly uh, well for us. Um, we already have presence in airports uh, and college campuses and hospitals. So those three are definite proven focus areas for us because they do well for us and our licensees. And so it makes sense for us to double down and grow those locations. Um, we're also actively exploring, you know, thinking about new location types, for example, stadiums, right? Or being in concert venues where our brand would, uh, would translate really well. And last but certainly not the least, the reason to think about this for small entrepreneurs is two more reasons. One is that, look, it gives your brand, as you're trying to build a brand and a presence, a disproportionate visibility. At an airport, so many people get to see the brand and you're punching above the weight, your weight, especially if you're a subscale brand, which most entrepreneurs will tend to be. And the second thing is that there's tremendous amount of non-traditional locations that give a leg up or preference to entrepreneurs who are more local, who may be coming from uh, underrepresented communities, uh, anybody that's sort of bringing something very authentic with a local flair to those locations. So there is definitely tailwinds for those kinds of people. I think what's super exciting for us, I mean, we're, we're a barbecue brand that's a media brand, but we're also trying to transform our barbecue model. We used to have a full service restaurant, 5,700 square feet, 250 people that were seating there. And for 13 years, that's how we ran it. And when the pandemic hit, everyone talks about pivoting. We didn't pivot. We went all in. We went all in on the internet, all in on ourselves. And our thesis is that slow food fast is what consumers want these days. So not fast food, but slow food, great food, great quality coffee in your case, tea in your case. And what you're talking about when I hear you speaking on other shows, when I when I dive into the, the coffee bean and tea leaf story is you are leveraging technology in a way to be omni-channel no matter where the distribution is. Can you talk about how the importance of technology and, and how you've incorporated it into building out these, these new non-traditional stores and traditional stores? Yeah, absolutely. Technology, not that long ago, was considered, particularly in the restaurant and food service space, you know, a differentiator. And there was a select few who had access to technology and they stood uh, apart. What's happened, thanks to the last few years of COVID impact, is that it's become table stakes. Right? It's an existential <laughs> existential need for whether you're a one location operator, you're a multi-site operator, you have to have a relevant technology presence. Well, let me share with you how we think about that and what we're doing. I think, first of all, you've got to think about the foundational. Um, the way technology works is it needs a basic foundation without which you can't do very much because most solutions are, think of it as building a block of Legos, right? You have to have a, some sort of a base and then you, you, you get Lego bricks and you, you build something on it that's relevant to you and sort of fits in yes. with pieces you have. The foundation of all technology are two or three things. You need a great point of sale system. Uh, you need ideally in today's time and age something that's cloud-based that you know, you, you're not maintaining servers on your premises. You need um, basic systems to process payment you need a, a network to allow your locations to access this and you need security, right? You need to be able to keep all of this secure in the world of um, bad actors, so to speak. That's the bare minimum foundation that everybody uh, needs. So we're investing behind replacing our foundation. We're, we're just replacing our entire point of sale system across the fleet. And then we thought about saying, hey, let's do two things. Think about our, our customer, both the internal customer as well as the external customer and see what their biggest needs are. For the external customer, what we're doing is revamping our loyalty program. Yes. 
So we've reimagined that. That's so, again, it's table stakes. We're reimagining what that looks like. We have a great one today. We think we could do better. And so with that comes an overhaul of our existing app. So working with uh, some really good partners there to redevelop our app, that will be launched on um, in December this year or relaunched, I should say. We already have an existing one. So, so some big investment going on there. And as I've discovered, right, anything that, something like the app, it's not in isolation. You need platforms uh, underpinning the app, uh, enabling the app that allow, you know, uh, communication to happen between your point of sale system and the ultimate consumer app. So we're looking at all that tech stack that sits in between. So that's one example of what we're doing. That's consumer facing. We're also evaluating um, our tech stack that's consumer facing in terms of websites. We have one website for uh, our brand. We have a separate one for e-commerce at the moment. We have uh, another one, a white label uh, website that we use for online ordering, and we're looking to integrate that. So we can move from a multi-channel yep. environment to what is truly called an omni-channel uh, environment. So that is something in the next uh, six to eight months that's on our roadmap. But on the internal uh, side, we looked at where the pain points for our baristas were. And what we found was our highest volume asset types are our drive-through cafes. And in our drive-through cafe, Sean, we discovered that um, we weren't satisfied with the speed of service, the productivity efficiency, and the pressure we were putting uh, on our barista. So what we've done is we're investing behind uh, drive-through timers so that we can keep track of lane time and how quickly we're able to turn uh, the cars through and creating a sense of healthy competition and creating opportunities to recognize teams that are doing better than others. So that's one. The second thing we've done is that uh, we had feedback from our teams about the need for more efficient, faster machines that they're making coffee and tea from. So we've uh, invested in these super um, automated coffee machines and they're not they're not automated to the sense that the coffee is still hand, handcrafted but there's things that are happening that are making the process um extremely fast right whether it's grinding the beans getting the milk to the right temperature uh, assembling the right beverage so we invested in uh, super automated uh, beverage uh, machines uh, the third thing uh, that we're doing is uh, looking at tablets to help line busting. So when, you know, consumers are in the drive-through or even in our cafes, right, we'll have a barista at peak with a tablet taking people's orders. So you don't have to wait till you get to the front of the line. You can get your order in and save a bunch of time. So those are things that we're doing that not just help the external consumer, but very much listening to the voice of our internal customer. So that's just to give you a flavor of some of the technology investments that we're making as we speak. And now a quick break from restaurant influencers to welcome our newest sponsor to the show, and that is Davo Sales Tax. Davo is an incredible company. I remember when we first opened up our restaurant in 2008, Cali Barbecue, we were struggling to figure out how to automate sales tax, how to have enough money in our account to file our quarterly taxes. I am so grateful that now Today, we have found Davo and they are a sponsor of the show and they are excited to help other business owners no longer have to become tax collectors. Davo does it all for you. They take care of the compliance. They take care of the collecting. They take care of the filing. Get your first month free by going to davosalestax.com slash influencers. Let them know that we sent you. Davo is an incredible company. We're grateful to have them on the show. They integrate with all the top POS companies, including Toast. DavoSalesTax.com slash influencers. Automate your sales tax today and get back to running your business. I appreciate you going through all of that due diligence. And it's something that we talk about frequently on the show because technology is at, is at the heart of what we call digital hospitality. 
what do we do so well in real life is hospitality. It's in our blood. The people listening to this show, we wouldn't be in the business if we didn't love taking care of other people. But now it has to be digital as well. And technology is going to either help enhance it or it's going to make it worse. If there's pain points in that tech stack, whether it's on the consumer facing side, whether it's on the barista facing side, it's going to make it difficult because people want frictionless. We're used to the Amazon experience. We're used to doing things where even now the drive through that you say, and I appreciate you going through the drive-through, but even when I go and I see at McDonald's or I see at a Chick-fil-A, they have a tablet out front, yet they're designing lanes for people that order ahead. So these people aren't even going to the drive-through because the drive-through takes too much time. I'd rather order ahead and then come and pick it up. Or some people are using DoorDash or Grubhub or Uber Eats to get those products to them. How do you guys think when you're designing for the future, how do you think real estate wise, do you design for these multiple touch points when you're talking about third party delivery, when you're talking about customers picking up, when you're talking about somebody that actually wants to sit and work inside a, a cafe and work on their laptop and buy something to eat? How, how do you guys think about that? Sean, the way that we think about that is to look two to three years ahead. So we're building cafes today and we're integrating into those locations technology that is relevant for today. So I'll give you an example. We have not had historically digital menu boards and we think that's just, you know, you got to do it. There's no yep. way that digital menu boards don't play. So those sort of hygiene things, which don't need a lot of thinking validation, you just put in there and what that's what we're doing. What we also do is we will create um, test cells uh, and little teams uh, ninja teams, right? That are innovation teams. And it, it could be one or two or three people. These are not massive groups of people, but they're constantly looking around the corner and figuring out what is it where the world is moving to and how can we try and leapfrog, right? What can we be doing? We don't think that we're a technology company, but we're a technology enabled company. So we're not looking to build these technologies. We're yep. just keeping an eye out to see who is developing what technology that's relevant um, listening to the voice of our internal and external customer, and then trying to fit in what is relevant technology and put it all into one prototype. So we're constantly looking to build prototypes with emerging technologies that allow us to test and validate and make this frictionless, highly engaging experience. And that, you know, you've got to be willing to fail, willing to put some resource behind it. And not everything that we test is going to work. And so that's how we um, figure things out. And then things that work for us there, we will bring those investments forward and then start putting them, scaling them out, um, you know, more, more globally, uh, be it in the US. We start with company stores and then we start to share them with our franchise community once we've validated it and know that this thing works. So that's how we think about it. Um, so, you know, the, the example of that would be even this line busting thing that others have figured out. We're trying to figure out how to make it work in our system, right? So yeah. we will have one store where we put all of these technologies together, including digital drive-through menu boards. And um, we're looking at other ways of automating the experience and then starting to say, okay, which of those components are working, which are not working. The comment that I will make, and I think restaurateurs will get, is that every time you overlay technology, you're doing a couple of different things. One is that your cost structure is going to shift in the business, whatever it is, right? It might lead to reduction of labor in some component of your business. It might need to some incremental capital that may need to be put or uh, an ongoing service fee or application fee of some kind. Be thoughtful about what it's doing to your economic model. See how it works for you, because that's really uh, important. And then where we're seeing benefit of technology, particularly around labor productivity, which is top of so many people's minds, we make sure to then build it back into our labor model. If you yeah. don't ask and challenge your operators to say, hey, now you've got all these machines doing all this wonderful stuff for you. You should be shaving off you know, a minute yes. per transaction. You better remember to go back and build that into your labor model and task that or you know, challenge your operators to deliver. Otherwise, you don't get the full benefit of it. Very true. I would love to, to hear your philosophy of what type of company are you? Because you're a coffee company, a tea company, yet you're also a restaurant company. You know, we're a company that brings flavors from around the world uh, to consumers to 
tickle their curiosity, to whet their appetite and expose them to adventures and experiences from around the world. Not everyone can go on you know, vacation at this very minute or travel to all these places, but what we're trying to do is to brew curiosity. Right? We have the benefit of accessing these wonderful coffees and teas from, you know, from Guatemala to Brazil to Kenya to Ethiopia to Sri Lanka to China to Taiwan, like you name it, right? So many wonderful, wonderful countries and cultures around the world. And we see ourselves as being the brand that's able to bring these tasted, this state, think of us as a global beverage house. We bring uh, taste adventures to, a, to our consumers. I love that brewing curiosity and creating a space that invites people in and gives them a chance to experience something that they possibly haven't experienced. I think one of the challenges that I know many restaurant owners make, I know I made in the beginning was how do you fight the need to diversify yet simplify? And we've gone full circle where we had a breakfast restaurant, lunch restaurant, dinner restaurant, had a menu, huge menu. And then now we're back to the point where we have very limited menu so that we can focus on what we do best. How do you how do you uh, how do you do that for for your business? This is such an ongoing uh, challenge. <laughs> out. I mean, first of all, I think. <laughs> Did I hit a hot button? <laughs> you hit a hot button right there, Sean. You're not uh, an ice cream company. You guys and... need an ice cream. <laughs> I wish I could tell you that we have it nailed, but I think here's how we think about it and what we learn. I think, first of all, you got to assume that this is not, life is not static. There isn't a one and done approach. So, you know, at some point, sometimes you got to uh, broaden your offering a little bit. Sometimes you got to narrow it back. Consumer demands uh, change, they shift, their preferences are, test, uh, are shifting. So first of all, I think the most important thing for us is how are we keeping in touch with trends and consumer needs? So what I mean by that is, let me give you a real life example. Um, Pre-COVID, the vast majority of our consumers were grabbing their favorite coffee or tea on either their way to work or on the way to school, right? Uh, our locations were all based in uh, areas where there was somebody who was, you know, close to your office or close to a school, right? Yeah. Uh, somewhere you were going or coming back from, as the case might be. Guess what? Now we live in a completely transformed world where people don't always show up to a conventional brick and mortar office five or six days a week. It's hybrid or work from home, et cetera. So first of all, that morning need an occasion, which was, hey, I'm on the go. I need to grab something quick and it's, it's my beverage and a bagel or whatever it was, right? That's evaporated. Yes. With one, one beverage per transaction, that's gone away. So what has happened is people are now working from home or a lot more people, right? And now at say 11 o'clock in the morning, they're feeling that that sort of need for a pick me up. Where's my coffee? Yeah, where's my coffee, right? And there's yeah. there's only so much you can do at home. And so now they're going off into the car and there's more, more than one person at home now. Yes. So the size of the check has grown. The number of beverages we sell per transaction has shifted. And by the way, if I'm going to haul my ass and get into a car and grab go grab something or have something delivered, I may as well get a bite to eat as well. Correct. Right? Because right. now I'm feeling my mid-morning sort of hunger pangs. So that's just a great example, real life that we've dealt with, where the consumer need just shifted like overnight. And so the kind of offering, when we staff, what, what kind of uh, menu we carry, what sort of food uh, complement we should carry, had to be re-looked at, right? So that's just a great example. It can't be static. So that's one. The second insight that, uh, one is learned, and I have battle scars to prove it, is that <laughs> if you are not carrying a beverage or an item of food that doesn't have strategic relevance or is extremely craveable or uniquely signature to you, it has no place. Yep. Consumers vote with their feet. People know what they love. If it's moving, you know people like it, and you want to do more of those things. If you're selling one a day or two a day of something, you know, your guests are telling you <laughs> that it's probably not, that's not where they're looking to buy whatever it is uh, from you. They probably want to get that from somewhere else. And that's probably because they, it's just not good enough for them or it's not what they're looking for or 
you know, it's like coffee, the coffee bean and tea leaf. We want to start selling flavored soda. That's not, that's not what our consumers want from us. So we may yeah. have the world's best range of, you know, that's, there's a whole emerging trend in people buying all these fancy old school flavored sodas. That's not what they're looking to buy from us. So it's got to be relevant. So I think that's how we think about it. Um, but we've now reached the sophistication where we understand how many SKUs we can have. We try and restrict the number of SKUs that we have and try and create consumer variety with limited SKUs. And, and, and uh, every four to six months, review how the portfolio is doing, chop, change, introduce new things and, and keep moving. And now a quick break from restaurant influencers to share an exciting new offer from our sponsor, Atmosphere TV. Go to atmosphere.tv forward slash BBQ to not only get Atmosphere TV for free, but also our audience is given the gift of $200 in ad credits, as well as free activation. Join more than 40,000 other venues who use Atmosphere TV by signing up with the code BBQ at atmosphere.tv forward slash BBQ. Keep guests entertained with Atmosphere TV because you have the ability to turn your promotions and your advertisements onto your television with this platform. The simple plug and play device lets you take control of the content on your screens. Keep guests entertained, engaged, and informed of real-time specials, career opportunities, and announcements that you can personalize within your own custom content dashboard. Tap into great channels such as America's Funniest Home Videos, Fashion, Throttle, Chive TV, Sports Highlights, Red Bull, Real Madrid, along with unbiased news and entertainment. There is something for everyone. Over 60 curated channels of short form, entertaining content to choose from right at your fingertips. They also have an incredible ad supported network that allows you to not only market within your four walls, but also locally or nationally if you desire. The platform gives you full control to dial in your marketing efforts. Please go and visit atmosphere.tv slash BBQ and let them know restaurant influencers sent you. I would love for you to talk about the blog and why it's important to have a blog. And it's something that I, I know is, is a far stretch for many restaurant owners that are listening to this show. And especially if they don't have a thousand units, 1100 units um, to dedicate a staff to, to write content. But this is a, this is a storytelling podcast. And we believe that there's never been a greater time for business owners to tell their story using all of the, I don't need to go create TikTok. I don't need to create Instagram. It's already there. If I'm willing to share the story of what's happening in my coffee shop, at my barbecue restaurant, wherever I am, I can build connection on a global scale. And that goes back to the e-commerce side. If you have something so compelling in your village, no matter where you are on earth, maybe, just maybe, if you share that story, someone else would find that compelling as well. How do you think about marketing holistically for, for, for the brand? Sean, I think that's a, that's a leading question if I ever saw one, but it's so true. Uh, people connect with people, people connect with brands, people connect with companies where they can relate to the story of the brand or the person uh, and there is some authenticity to it and there's some vulnerability to it and there is some narrative that they can relate to. So for, for me personally and for our brand, storytelling is hypercritical. Uh, I see that in, in two dimensions. One is to embellish the narrative around your brand and to elevate your brand, right? Create um, position your brand and tell the story of your brand and what your what your story is, but tell your own personal story. Because one of the most critical things for a restaurateur is to create a culture that is intimate, that people want to come work in, that consumers want to be part of, right? And when you think about how to build cultures, be it brand cultures, company cultures, organizational cultures, team cultures, one critical component of culture is storytelling. And so how do we tell stories and what do I do? I'll just share with you some examples. I think, first of all, from a brand perspective, we like to um, curate our stories through from our consumers. Uh, we live in a world today where our consumers are putting coffee, bean, and tea leaf in the middle of their lives and they're taking pictures and putting hashtags and 
essentially creating the content, right? Yeah, user-generated content. User-generated content. So the, yeah. the most engaging posts we have are posts that we are reposting what our consumers are saying about the coffee bean. It is the most authentic way because they are finding ways of consuming our product, uh, inserting it into their daily life, you know, giving them what, what they're looking for. So it's, it's not that hard. They, these are simple things to do. Uh, it's not even a full-time job. You can find somebody who's an intern or, you know, a somebody who's starting off and like, who can do this for you if you don't have the skills yourself. So I would strongly encourage people, not all content has to be brand created. It has to be, uh, it can be user generated as well. The second thing is, you know, have the three, four, five bullet points in your head on what your brand story is. You know, I, I call it, bullet through the head clarity. Communication is about clarity. If you are not clear yourself about what story you want to tell, it is highly unlikely <laughs> where you're going to be able to tell the story. So we like to have a you know very simple bulleted list about what is it that you know is our brand story and what is it that we want to tell people. For example, five wonderful uh, coffee beans are sourced from different origins that make up our espresso blend. And we roast each of these five uh, single origin beans separately before we blend the espresso blend that then forms its way into your latte or your ice blended drink or most beverages that people have from coffee bean. That is very different from what other coffee players do. To save time and money, they just take whatever their blend is and then roast it all. And that's like, it's the opposite of diff different strokes for different folks. You are not maximizing the potential of every God-given coffee bean and bring out the best. <laughs> in, yes. in it. So that is one uh, facet of our story. What is yours? Uh, the second thing is internal storytelling. I'm a huge fan of that. And I'm bringing that up because uh, culture is going to be built on internal storytelling. Very, very simple thing that uh, one can do is give people the space and forum to share their stories, other people who work for you, pe people who work alongside you. One of the things that works for me is when I'm visiting our cafes and I, feel, I see outstanding leaders of, of phenomenal baristas, I'll just do a 60 second to two minute video take with them. Whip out my phone, put it on uh, selfie mode or whatever, right? And just say, hey, look, I just noticed you've got the best culture in your cafe. Tell me, how do you do it? And people are just delighted to share their story. And we've created an internal YouTube channel. We've not had to invest any money in it. And we've provided access to all our locations. And it's just magic, right? It's nothing that I'm doing or somebody else is doing. It's how people who come work for the brand are creating culture and are adding to the culture of the organization. And storytelling is just the most compelling way of building uh, culture. These are our consumers, their families, their friends are our consumers, and that's how the brand is formed. So the, just two very, very simple examples, I would say, of what people can be doing to tell stories, uh, but do it in a way that's authentic and real and not contrived, because people can sniff that out very quickly. So Sanjeev, I've, uh, I'm very fortunate to get asked to go speak at hospitality conferences. And these are the things that I talk about. And I take my cell phone out and I interview CEOs and I put them on TikTok. And the fact that you guys have an internal YouTube channel where you're doing the things that I'm literally telling people to do. And the hardest the hardest are the people that are running the biggest corporations. You know, they feel like they can't be vulnerable, that they're going to say something, that their shareholders are going to go hold you accountable for something that you should. That's the fear. I mean, that's the fear for a business owner of posting B2B content instead of just B2C content or showing their kitchen. Well, what if somebody sees something in my kitchen in the comments, then they're not going to come into my restaurant. Well, if you get to the heart of the story, the energy, the vibe, the frequency, this is what you taking your pot, your your time to stop someone for 60 seconds and share their story and highlight them that's the most authentic thing possible because no one's been asked to share their story the fact that you the ceo are doing that and i can't i can't applaud you enough for doing that and i really hope that other leaders that are listening to that are inspired and i hope that at one point that is not just an internal video I hope that the coffee bean considers putting that on a TikTok channel because those are the things that need to be highlighted because it's all industries can learn from the hospitality of our leaders. I mean, it's something that I truly at my core feel very, very strongly about because it is hard to do. 
it's hard to go, what is this technology? We don't know how to do a, a TikTok channel for 1,100 units. That's the stuff. That's the magic. The magic is the stuff that we see every single day that we're not willing to highlight. We don't need a huge film crew to do it. We don't need an agency to do it. We literally just need the thing that you and I have and that everyone that's listening to this show has in, our, in their pocket. Can you talk to me about why mentorship is so important to you? So the restaurant industry, food service industry is, uh, I'm not sure that everybody realizes, is the second largest employer in the United States. Uh, as an industry. It's enormous, right? One out of five people in the US have worked in the restaurant industry at some stage of their lives. Um, the magic of our industry is that you don't need to have fancy degrees uh, to join and be successful uh, at, in this industry. The downside of this industry is also that there isn't always structured leadership development accessible um, to certainly the front lines, but even you know, uh, to a lot of people, early mid-stage career folks in the industry, it's not the easiest. When you think about companies like packaged goods and you know the big brands, et cetera, they have all this internal machinery and resources and they kind of make all these investments in their talent and development. And when we do a great job, the restaurant industry does skill-based training right, which we do well, and then we'll do the occasional sort of one leadership session or what have you, but we don't have an ongoing. Yeah. I started off my career as a restaurant general manager. And the reason I, um, I progressed in my career was because throughout my journey, people took the time to sit me down, uh, whether it was tough love or encouragement or take chances or share their wisdom. Uh, they mentored me and I benefited a tremendous amount from it. I also grew up in a company called Yum Brands. I spent 20 years of my career there that does an exceptional job with uh, leadership development and mentoring. And so when I looked at what was happening around the industry, I just thought like, hey, one way of paying it forward is to figure out ways of mentoring people. And I would therefore um, mentor people formally, informally. And then I, during COVID said, hey, there's got to be a way of scaling this because so many more people need to do it. So how do we make sure that people who need it and are thirsty and are lifelong learners and want to get ahead can have access to great mentors. And we created this nonprofit organization with a few more kindred spirits uh, from the industry that we call GLEAM Network. Uh, GLEAM stands for Global Leadership Enhancement and Mentorship Network. We have a chapter in India as well. Um, and it's really a group of very talented uh, industry execs, middle uh, level managers who are all willing to pay it forward by making themselves available and accessible as mentors. So what we do is um, we have this website called gleannetwork.net. Anybody who wants to invest in themselves and get their career ahead at almost at next to no cost, right? There's a marginal cost that takes care of the software license fee, et cetera, that we use for mentoring. But practically to access the quality and caliber of leaders we make available to them uh, is if, you know, like if you would be going externally, you'd be paying, you know, a couple of thousand dollars just to access uh, a few conversations with these level of yeah. le leaders. So that's what we've done and created through Gleam Network. Uh, and I would use the platform of, of this podcast to encourage folks yes. who truly want to you know, get ahead, invest in their careers, want to ask the questions of someone who's been there, done that, um, and, and get counseled. What a great uh, opportunity to do that. And if you're somebody in life who got a leg up themselves and wants to pay it forward, please sign up to be a mentor with us, right? Um, and we'll, you, you just we'll signed me up. I'm, I'm in. You, you've convinced me. So if you're listening to this show, I will, uh, I will, I will be donating my time because I, I believe, I believe in what you're building. Um, the Gleam Network. We're going to put a link in the show notes. But uh, I, I can't tell you how passionately I feel about this industry, about the global, the fact that my my wife, my family, were they're from Bulgaria. Every year I go and I spend time in Bulgaria, in the village, in the city. I talk to restaurant owners. I talk to shop owners. Everything that we're talking about here today it's applicable no matter where you are in the world. The technology is everywhere. The people want things. They want great food, but they want it faster. They want great coffee. They want great tea, but they want to be able to access it on their terms. I mean, this is just the world.
world that we live in. And there's other people from other industries that if they've already done it, why not ask them for help, ask them for guidance, ask them for mentorship, because there are so many people that are willing to provide it. It's incredible. Well, you know, what I've seen is when the student is ready, the teacher will appear, right? There's some, some wise man or woman said these words. I, and I find that mentorship is not for everyone, but it is for those people who are truly ready to invest in themselves and have that awkward, vulnerable conversation with someone that they don't know and say, I think I could do with help. I'd love you for you to be my mentor. And it's okay to say, I don't even know where to start to help me figure out yes. and navigate how to get the best out of this relationship. But if you've not tried it and you haven't had mentorship in your life, um, no matter where you are, I would strongly encourage you to um, seek that. Uh, can you talk to us about why, why giving back is such a, such a pillar for, for the coffee bean and tea leaf? You know, for us, we um, were truly humbled by a couple of things personally, right? First off, we are in this world of fast moving turnover, uh, talent retention being so much of a challenge. We have tremendous tenure in our cafes. We have people who work for us for years and years and years and quite candidly are the backbone of our business. They hold the communities together that they operate in. Our guests are coming, looking for their barista because when they walk through the door, the barista already knows what they want and they're already preparing the drink. It's that little human connection that sets their whole day. So that's the magic. And these people are showing up and we're not paying them millions, right? We're taking care of them. We're obviously providing them a nurturing environment and a, and a, and a good culture, but one has to, like my heart's filled with gratitude because they show up and they do what they do. Uh, that pays my bills and my I get my paycheck because our frontline teams are doing what they're doing. And then the second thing is the core product that we have, coffee and tea, almost none of that comes from the US. These products, uh, the beans and the tea is grown in places far away from home. And the people growing these things, right? Uh, the, the, the coffee cherry or the tea leaf and picking them and um, processing them, the primary processing that happens close to where the farms are like these these folks have tough lives and they're doing a lot to you know uh, give, give back in the sense that they're working hard so we can enjoy these beverages and and the best quality products and i think the combination of those two things really wants one uh, makes one want to give back and make sure that we take care of our own right and then we pay it forward to uh, our communities be it our own people who show up for us either in our cafes or show up for us in our in in the farm where the where the magic happens and i think that's just made us uh, inherently uh, oriented in that way and by the way the side benefit is that customers love that today more than ever before they want to see companies that you know are paying it forward and employees love that so suddenly now it's become the politically correct thing to do as well, but we do it because it's the right thing to do. Yep. Uh, in fact, our internal program is called Caring Cup. That's our internal brand for it. And this is how we pay back and pay it forward um, to, to our communities. I love that. Uh, so my grandfather was fortunate. I, I never met my father, but I was raised by my grandfather who's Bulgarian. And he taught me to stay curious, to get involved and to ask for help. So we are going to put a link in there for the Gleam Network. Um, we hope that you guys sign up for that. We also put on a weekly uh, call on the audio app called Clubhouse. That's every Wednesday and every Friday for an hour. We have a mastermind group of hospitality professionals, sales professionals, marketing professionals, and that's 10 a.m. Pacific time on Clubhouse. And what we like to do is give people a shout out for getting involved. So it's one thing to be curious to listen to a podcast. It's another thing to do the work. You actually have to sign up and be vulnerable and ask that question and say, I need help. Can you help me succeed? I'm trying to do something with marketing. I'm trying to do something with sales. I'm trying to go from one restaurant to two restaurants or 10 restaurants to 25 restaurants, whatever you're trying to do, come be vulnerable, share of yourself. I want to give a shout out to Joey Rea. Um, he goes by Joey Meatballs, but he sells mozzarella cheese on the East Coast. Um, I want to give Joey a shout out because he's 
the type of salesperson that is curious, that is helping operators, not just to sell cheese, to make better pizzas. He's giving them tools about marketing, about sales, about leadership, the things that we talk about in the room. So Joey, shout out to you. Um, Sanjiv, I want to give you an opportunity. Uh, I know you have uh, probably, how many, how many employees do we have? Uh, close to 2000. Close to 2000. Okay. So give me an employee that is top of mind that gets a shout out. Somebody that uh, has gone above and beyond that. Um, they'll be, they'll be grateful that they got this uh, entrepreneur shout out. Yeah. I'd like to give a shout out to Miguel. Miguel is one of our um, just newly promoted district managers. He used to be the general manager of our, one of our highest volume drive through cafes. Uh, he joined us as a barista and grew, grew within the system, just tremendous passion and heart. He's a fabulous craftsman. He just makes the best um, coffees and teas and teaches his people. But most importantly, he's really a, a smart entrepreneur, a smart business leader with a big heart and produces phenomenal results and builds great teams for us. So Miguel, big shout out to you. Thank you. There you go, Miguel. I love it. Sanjiv, thank you for leading for leading by example with everything that you do. Um, if you guys want to get in touch with me, it's at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. Um, please take a look at the article, uh, follow the sponsors. Thank you to Atmosphere TV. Thank you to Davo. Thank you to Toast um, for believing in this show so that we can have incredible, incredible guests that are literally transforming how business is done on a global scale, um, bringing these lessons and stories home. Sanjiv, thank you so much. Where's the best place uh, for people to connect with you? Uh, LinkedIn at Sanjeev Razdan's my handle. You'll find me there um, on LinkedIn. Um, so I look forward to connecting with your. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, for being vulnerable as a leader, for putting out content, for coming on this show and sharing your wisdom and for um, for setting up networks like the Glean Network. We're, we, we truly are grateful. Thank you guys for listening. We appreciate it. Uh, please write a review, share the podcast with someone who needs it, and uh, we will catch you next week. Thank you. Bye now. And a special thank you to our title sponsor, Toast. Toast is the primary technology partner that we use at our restaurant, Cali Barbecue. It is also the primary technology partner that so many of the guests have shared with us on this show. People like Sam, the cooking guy, Stacy Poonkinney, Jeff Alexander. So many times the guests tell us that they're using Toast when we didn't even know that going into the interview. That is why we are so grateful that they sponsor this show. We want you to win. You that listen to this show, we want you to improve your digital hospitality. Toast is built for restaurants and it's built for you. Toast is the restaurant first platform that's built for your needs, whatever your size, concept, or ambitions. Improve your bottom line with a customizable platform that's easy to learn, use, and grow with. And it meets you where you are with all the right tools for your price point. If you have any questions about Toast, please DM me at Sean P. Walchef, S-H-A-W-N-P-W-A-L-C-H-E-F. I will get you the link to the right Toast contact in your market. It's so important that if you listen to this show, that you win. We want you to be on this show eventually. Let us know that you heard the show, you heard about Toast, you implemented Toast, you did a Toast unboxing in your restaurant. Talk to us about how you've impacted your village, your city, your community. Share your Toast story with us. DM me today to learn more. And be sure to check out Toast.